Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Samuel! Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are continuing to work our way through the gospel narrative. This is Gospels Part 74. Last week we looked at a section of scripture in the Gospel of John that is very controversial in that some people think that it doesn't even belong in the canon scriptures, but Hmm. you and I found there to be so much wisdom with uh, the story of the scribes and the Pharisees bringing this woman who was caught in the act of adultery and using her as kind of a prop to be able to trap Jesus, find grounds to arrest him by either breaking what the Romans want with capital punishment or what Jewish culture and customs with the Torah, what, what it has to say about it. And Jesus turns the whole matter on its head by doing some very cryptic, mysterious drawings in the dirt that you, you and I speculated that he was acting out Jeremiah seventeen thirteen. All these people were going against the Lord and their names are going to be written in the earth. And yeah. he, uh, he po- poses this rhetorical question to them about, look at your own life and see if you have any sin present. And if you don't, then like you're free to cast the stone. And they all left because they, they could see that there's no way that they could answer that honestly. And we ended with Jesus understanding and seeing this woman and her wrongdoing but choosing not to condemn her and sending her on her way and like spurring her on to practice repentance in her life that's right yeah it was a great great image and where we pick up you know on one hand it it feels like it could be kind of an abrupt scene change or I mean, who knows? Maybe this is once he was done talking to her, he just kind of turned around and continued talking to other. I don't know. You, you can't really tell. But if, if nothing else, the topic changes. And so we're going to pick up there. It's John chapter 8, verses 12 to 14. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. Super interesting. He calls himself the light of the world. Now, recently, Samuel, he had just declared himself to be something else at the end of the big Sukkot ceremony. What was that? A living water. Yeah, I'm living water. Now he's saying I am the light of the world. So, what we may not realize, and I don't know if I've, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier or not. I kind of feel like I didn't. Associated with the festival of Sukkot were these great, big, gigantic festival lamps. I guess you could call them, but they, I mean, they were big, big, big. They had to be erected, and and people had to climb up them, and you know, I'm saying these were big, big lamps. They were so big and produced so much light, they could actually be seen quite a distance away. And and that's where we get this idea. Not, that's not where we get the idea. It, it was another way in which Israel was called the light of the world because they had this festival and these big lamps and all this thing. It's kind of an amazing little story, right? So Jesus, he's making another one of his I am statements. I, I think we mentioned this before. People count them so many different ways. It's it's not even worth us talking about it too awful much. It's just noticing that all throughout John's gospel, John purposely is making Jesus give these I am statements, obviously relating back to God when he calls himself I am. But point is, 
uh, this I am statement connects to something. Samuel, why don't you read from us from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Yeah. Now, I only clipped a part of it. And why am I including this? Because traditionally, this was understood, like even before Jesus, this was understood to be about Messiah. I will make you as a light for the nations. And he calls himself the light of the world. I love that. So good. So when we read that, uh, first of all, because it's in Isaiah and it was a long, long time ago, you could read it and say, well, look, that's God speaking about Israel you know, the nation of Israel. But, again, I said traditionally they looked at it and said, oh, but this is also about Messiah. Because Messiah is supposed to be the one who represents all of Israel in himself. And of course, that's the way we look at Jesus. He represented all of Israel uh, in in his uh, sinlessness, his righteousness, whatever. It's kind of a cool thing. Covenantally speaking. Either way, we get this clear connection Jesus is making. John, he's contrasting light and darkness. And we've seen this in his gospel before, and we're going to see it some more. It's a recurring theme in John's gospel, contrasting light and dark. But Jesus says this cool thing. He says that we, uh, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Okay, so this will not walk in darkness thing. I think, well, we could read this passively, and I'll talk about that in a second. But I think if if we did that and only that, we'd be making a mistake. We need to look at it both ways, passive and active. And I'll tell you what I mean. From a passive perspective, you could say, oh, okay, because you follow him, you follow Jesus, you will experience the benefit of life. You won't be groping around in the darkness, because he will illuminate the world. He will illuminate truth for you. So that's kind of a passive way of reading that. The active way of reading it is to say, look, because you follow him, it is those that follow him who are supposed to follow him in a particular manner. It is a manifestation of their faith. They, okay, we could say, will not walk in darkness, or we might say, so you understand it better, they do not walk in darkness. And you could say they will have the light of life, or you could say they have the light of life. And and what I mean is they're walking in as much righteousness as they can, not to earn anything, but because it. To, to, he deserves that. It's reasonable service. And they have this light of light. It's how they're even identified as true followers. Words don't cut it. You got to show it. Now, the thing is, though, he says all of that, and the Pharisees respond. And, you know, I guess it may be predictable or something. They whip out a legal argument. And they say, hey, Jesus, you're just being a witness for yourself. That's not acceptable. And, okay, from a legal perspective, well, they're totally right. I mean, you just got to be fair. They are. But I want you to notice something. when In this section, when you're reading that something is not true or is true or whatever, we're not talking about the binary, like when we think in the world of true and false. When we say that something is true, we're talking about something that is faithful or trustworthy, or reliable, or acceptable, uh, something along those lines. Uh, and, and that is the way in which this relates to a witness and his testimony in a courtroom. So when it says your testimony is not true, it's like saying your testimony is not acceptable. And Jesus answered and says, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is acceptable, right? That that kind of thing. That's how you need to read that. But anyway, uh, what am I saying here? I'm saying uh, Jesus, he's kind of responding by moving the conversation away from, from just the literal legal stuff to something greater, which 
That seems to be a, a habit of his, a pattern of his, right? Something spiritual, something heavenly. And so even if what they are saying is correct, and in the strictest legal sense it was, Jesus is saying, I still know that I am the best witness ever because I know me. I know where I'm from. I know what I've been through. And you don't know me. You don't know where I'm from. You don't know what I've been through. And of course, we we know he's talking about that he came from heaven, that he was going to be returning to heaven. But just think about that, Samuel. If, If I said something to you, and it's just sounded wrong. From everything that you knew, it's like, no, no, no way. And my, my reasoning back to you was, listen, Samuel, I know that you can trust what I'm telling you because I know me. <laughs> I mean, does that work for you? Is that going to convince anybody? Not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least not everybody. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it doesn't really come across as a great response uh, in that, you know, if, if you don't understand what he's saying, it just sounds kind of like gobbledygook. Now, we tend to make sense of it because we're going, well, come on, he's Messiah. He was resurrected. We know, we know that he is. But for them, I'm just saying we need to give them a little room because he's making kind of a strange claim here. But he doesn't just say that. It isn't just, hey, you got to trust me because, you know, I know me. I'm I'm trustworthy. He goes a little outside the bounds of their current legal system. And and what he's saying is it's because of his unique origin. He is from heaven. He is from God. And so there is a sense in which it should be actually qualify as reliable, acceptable, faithful, trustworthy testimony. But they don't see it. And and here, I think, is what we're getting at. If they truly understood the scriptures, they would recognize that he himself, that his words, well, they're the same words as what they're seeing in the scripture. And therefore, they should be able to make the connection. They should be able to accept him, who he is, what he's saying, as trustworthy. Yeah, definitely. And I'm just walking away from this small section with the the sense that the suspense of Jesus' words to the Jewish leadership and the people in general continues to escalate. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel like that... We've talked about it before with the the dividing line in his ministry after before and after the transfiguration, and I feel like before that he was spending a whole lot of time illustrating and explaining and teaching what the kingdom is going to be like for those who decide to get on board with kingdom like lifestyle here and now um and then after that, it seems like he does more of this describing who he is himself. Um, And I know at least in the Gospel of John, like here he talks about, I am the light of the world. Later in a couple chapters, he's going to say, I am the good shepherd. So Mm -hmm. it it seems like he's unveiling more about himself than what he did previously. Oh, yeah, you're going to see a lot of that. And, you know, it's going to feel like we teeter back and forth a little bit as we go, because, again, there's a lot to cover. But, yeah, you're absolutely right, Samuel. He really is. He's he's laying it on him. And the fact that you were talking about the conversation escalating in a smaller context, just what the conversation he's having here with his current opponents, that's going to happen here, too. So we may as well show you that. Uh, John chapter 8, verses 15 through 20. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet, even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself and The father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? 
Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. But no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So, uh, let's at least, uh, let's knock down some goofiness. Shall we do that, Samuel? I'm ready. Yeah, so when, when Jesus says, I judge no one, well, this is another one of those favorite verses of those who don't want you, meaning anyone else, to put any responsibility on them for their, for their own thoughts and words and actions. And, I mean, just to be clear, this should not be taken too literally, if there is such a thing. This isn't about, you can't judge me, you know, that sort of attitude. It has nothing to do with that. Jesus' mission is in two parts. So this first visit, the one that we're reading about in the Gospels, was all about salvation, redemption. The second visit, and this is when we're talking about the kingdom and the judgment to follow, all of that, that's when he, he'll be being the judge. He, he wasn't really here to judge this time. Okay, that's true enough. And, and this kind of harkens back to, neither do I condemn you, right? But his next words, <laughs> and this is important, even though he says, I judge no one, his next words are, yet, even if I do judge, right, leaving the door open for, yeah, it's okay. He certainly has the right to anytime he wants His point continues with the idea that Jesus doesn't judge according to the flesh, and the inference here, of course, is like they do. He judges in concert or in sync with the Father, and therefore, his judgment will result, it will result in justice, true justice, meaning his judgment is true, like faithful, acceptable, reliable, trustworthy, all of that. So it, it, just to get an eye, uh, a picture of this, Samuel, look at Isaiah chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. Read what I got snipped out of there. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Yeah. Again, another instance where, okay, it was pretty commonly accepted that this had something to do with the coming Messiah, and and that's exactly what Jesus is doing right here. We see that fulfilled in his very life. It's kind of neat. But then he he does something kind of cool. He says, uh, he refers, uh, how does he say it? In your law, it is written that the testimony of two, uh, two people is true or whatever, right? In your law. Now, okay, again, don't get goofy on me. This isn't some sort of sly move by Jesus to somehow separate himself from the law or to separate himself from Torah. That sort of a, hey, that's yours, not mine. That is not what is going on here. Jesus is saying something more like, hey, in in this law that you claim is your own, or in this law that you're trying to use against me, or in this law of which you all think you are the acknowledged authorities, or, you know, that kind of thing, right? Jesus isn't separating himself from it. He's just laying it on them, saying, hey, you're the ones taking ownership of this. Let's talk, it. let's let's speak from that. So Jesus is, he's declared that his own witness is true in the spiritual sense, or in the heavenly sense. But now what he's going to do is go back and he's, he's declaring that it's true, even according to this law that they're trying to use to reject him with. So he's, he's go, he, he sort of went away from their point a little bit, and now he's going back to it. So he starts by reiter- reiterating their point. The testimony of two people is true. And we read that before. It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 15 to 19. But at this point, now we've got agreement. Both parties, Jesus and his opponents, they're agreeing to this idea that testimony of two people is true, and they're they're sort of both accepting the criteria, and then, <laughs> I don't know, you could think this is fair, or you could think it's unfair, whatever, 
But Jesus says that there are, in fact, two witnesses. Himself, Jesus, and the Father, God. (laughs) Now, from a legal perspective, this argument probably carried no weight at all, okay? But, oh my goodness, Samuel, when I saw this, this made me all giggly inside because it's just so good. (laughs) This is so in line with Judaism up to this point, the scriptures up to this point, everything that's already come to pass. And it's like, what? How can you say that? Well, check it out. The prophets, the prophets, the ones that are actually in the scriptures, okay? They were also witnesses unto themselves because who else could possibly have been a witness? They were a witness unto themselves, and God was a witness for them. And they accept the prophets. And so Jesus is only using the same criteria to say, and you should accept me. Now, in the case of the prophets, okay, maybe it required a little time, uh, you know, hindsight or something for them to really recognize, dude, this stuff is great. We need to put it in our book. I don't know, but think of it. Jesus is going to have the resurrection coming in the future. So it's the same. I just think that is the most remarkable, fantastic, beautiful picture in the world. I completely agree. And actually, I was just recently reading, I'm reading through Exodus currently and reading an accompanying Midrash with it. And that part where God calls Moses to go speak his words to Pharaoh. I mean, it's in the text itself, but the Midrash just explores it more. Moses is nervous to go to the Israelites. He's like, "How are they going to believe me that I'm, yeah. I'm I'm saying the words of God?" Because in 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 a, in a way, he's saying, "You're asking me to go to be a witness unto myself, like mm-hmm. completely alone." I mean, ultimately, God came alongside him and used Aaron in that process. But I mean. Moses in Judaism was one of the pinnacle prophet to the people, and if he right. struggled with this concept, then um, it just confirms that Jesus is touching on that same subject now. Yeah, yeah, and in your story, God went with Moses in some ways, different ways. We see that, and in this instance, Jesus is saying, I am simply the manifestation, the embodiment of everything that you have already seen and heard, right? And so his witness is different, but I don't know. Anyway, it's just a great picture, such a great picture. Another interesting thing that happens in here is when Jesus is talking, he says, you know, I'm the one who bears witness about myself and the father who sent me bears witness. So notice that he says, the father, And right after that, the Pharisees respond with, where is your father? So you can see Jesus was trying to speak about the heavenly father. They're pulling it back down to his earthly father. Mm. Okay. Now, is it, is it possible that this is kind of a dig? I mean, Jesus's earthly father, we say Joseph and we know he's dead at this point, right? Is that kind of a dig at him? Uh, They're bringing it back from heavenly to earth. Now, the question is, do they, do they really understand? Do they understand that he meant to say the Father is in po- talking about God or not? Or are they, they being snarky on purpose? Or did they really just not understand? We, we don't know for sure. John loves to tell the stories. He loves to present Jesus' opponents as misunderstanding. He actually uses it like a literary tool. Uh, not really sure. You know, another thing that they could be doing, remember we had this little confusion. It's like they didn't know that he was born in Bethlehem, and so maybe they're even questioning his lineage from David or whatever, all that stuff. Either way, we don't know. Did they really know what he was saying? They were just being buttheads, or did they not really know what he was saying, and this was just sort of their natural response? Don't know. But either way, Jesus goes with it. But this is kind of cool. He starts by saying, the Father. They turn it around and where is your father? And so he goes, he starts calling him my father instead of the father, (laughs) Mm. which I don't know. Is it possible? Is Jesus kind of giving him a little dig right back? 
I don't know, right? It's But it's kind of cool in the text. The thing is, Jesus is saying, you don't know me. You don't know the Father. If you knew me, you would know him and vice versa. Uh, so it's a consistent message from Jesus to those who do not see and accept who he is. So I, it's just good. Good, good argument. Mm-hmm. But one final thing. Samuel, where does it say he was speaking? In the treasure, in the treasury. In the treasury. Where was that? Well, here's the thing. It's a very public place. And, and the, the treasury was referring to the idea that, first of all, many people would come through the temple for many different reasons. They would come and they would drop money into a chest. Now, depending on the time and crowd and all this kind of stuff, uh, it could be anywhere from one to the most I think we know about is 13 chests. And people would come by and drop money in. And so this little area where they had the chests sitting open was simply referred to as the treasury. So it wasn't it wasn't like this really official, official place, but there you go. And And then... Okay, there's there's not uh, consensus. There's a little bit of argument, but but many suggest that this was near the court of women, and the reason that's important is because that's where. Remember, I told you about those giant festival lamps that they would put up during Sukkot. That's where they stood. They stood in and around the court of women. So remember, this all started with. I am the light of the world. And he's speaking at the treasury, which is near the court of women, which is where the big lamps are. Mm -hmm. So this is super cool imagery. And here we have Jesus, bold, unafraid, teaching, I don't know, maybe even arguing in the temple. It's all very public. And yet no one arrests him. We know they wanted to. But John adds a little bit here. And I think he's suggesting some sort of divine or supernatural protection because his reasoning is no one arrested him because his time had not come. And I, I don't know how you tie that to any natural thing. I, I, I don't know how that would work. So it kind of gives you the sense that, no, nope, Jesus was supernaturally protected while he was doing this, which I don't know. It's all very interesting. Mm, yeah. And, oh, man, this last point about spoke in the treasury and that connection to the core of the women where the giant lamp stood now that now that gets me excited because i've learned that rabbinically when rabbis are teaching people or their direct disciples students it's not like our current uh, preconceived notion of how education is in the west where a lot of things is just an abstract giving of facts and ideas rabbis would make their learning very uh tactile very uh, practical very visual at times and we've already seen this in jesus he's done this before like think back to the parable of jesus saying like if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed i tell you you can say to this mountain move and it will move for you well some suggest that they were standing near the mountain where um, Herod wound up building the temple complex on top on top of. And then another yeah. time, Jesus is telling his disciples, like, I tell you, or when he's talking to Peter, and he's like, the gates of hell will not overcome, like, the kingdom that I am placing in your all's hands after I leave. Well, the area that they were at there, the Syrophoenician area, was known as, like, the gates of hell based on their... Right. idolatry and very evil ways of living and treating people. And so, again, just fits so well with Jesus being seen as a teacher and a rabbi and, and doing it within the custom that he's living now. It wasn't abstract. Yeah. He wasn't an alien on earth. Like He was a Jew, first century, doing very Jewish things. Exactly. And that's one of the hopes here in the podcast is that, look, we're trying to help you paint an image in your head so that we can see these things that you were just describing, Samuel. It's so good, so good. Because how else are we going to know? There's so many scholars across so much time that are unearthing all of this information and all of these ties. 
And we're just trying to use them to help people see what's going mm-hmm. on. So, so good. So good. All right. So what's next? I can see it in your eyes, Samuel. You're, you're afraid that this conversation Jesus is having with them might have come to an end. You're hoping that there's <laughs> something more. Well, I got good news. John chapter 8, verses 21 through 27. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself? Since he says, Where am I going, you cannot come? And he said to them, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Okay. So, he starts off with, I am going away, and where you're, I'm going, you cannot come. You're going to die. In, I mean, this, wow. This had, it had to sound kind of weird, right? Had to sound a little bit crazy to them and uh, maybe anyone, even the people who believed. But Jesus is basically laying out his opponent's future. He's saying, look, I'm going to die. And I think from our perspective, in hindsight, He's also saying, and I will ascend to heaven. That's, you know, where he is going. They cannot come. And then he says, you will have a change of heart. You will seek me, but you will die in your sin. Side note, it's pretty tough being a part of that generation. Mm -hmm. But he says, you can't go where I'm going. Now, it seems reasonable or maybe reasonably obvious to us that Jesus is speaking of his murder there on the cross and his ascension to heaven, but John has these Pharisees completely puzzled. And I have to say, if, you, if you're really being fair, trying to put yourself in their shoes, completely understandable. What is this guy talking about? What does he mean? And then they ask this question, is he going to kill himself? Is that where he's going that that we cannot come? Well, Samuel, where are you going to end up if you kill yourself? Uh, Not the good place, (laughs) probably not. Yeah, the suggestion is that he would descend to Gehenna, right? In In your New Testament, you're going to see it translated as hell, not a good translation, it's Gehenna. It's the it's the place of the dead. It's not paradise. It is instead Gehenna. It's a place of punishment. So the expectation if someone were to take his own life, that that was a bad thing, and that he would be in Gehenna. So you can kind of see it. This is where their minds are going. Well, Jesus explains. Here's the deal, guys. You are earthly. You are of creation. I am heavenly. I am not of creation. Now, that's not to say he wasn't human. He was. But he's also God. He came from God. So he's heavenly. He's not of creation. And he he emphasizes, as if saying it once wasn't enough, I told you you would die in your sins. But Samuel, where are they going to go if they die in their sins? Paradise or? Oh, Gehenna. Gehenna. Yeah. So they were questioning, where are you going to go? You're going to kill yourself and end up in Gehenna? And he's like, no, I told you, 
you were going to die in your sins. You're the ones who are bound for Gehenna. But Jesus also reiterates the way out of their fate. All they have to do is believe that Jesus is he. A little bit cryptic there, right? Mm. Believe that he is he. Well, who is that? We know, looking back, that he means that he is the Messiah. And if we change the language a little bit, it's just they have to believe that Jesus is he that they seek, the one they've been seeking, which then it's more obviously the Messiah. Though they appear to be blind, that he's right there and they can't see him. So there again, they're just fighting it, and but they want him to say it. Say that you're the Messiah. Now, maybe they want him to say it because they think that they could then arrest him or something. That could be. Or maybe because they really want to know. I mean, would you just say it? Would you just be plain? Even his opponents, I, you know, they may have been wrestling within themselves. We know within the Pharisees, you had people like Nicodemus and his buddies. And think about it, Samuel. The same passion that they currently have to kill this supposedly false guy, well, that same passion could be applied to following what they finally understand to be the true guy. It could be an awesome thing. Their passion, in one sense, has a potential to be a good, good thing, but it's directed at the wrong place. But again, they lay it out. Who are you? But Jesus remains elusive in his speech. Remember how excited we were when he finally said it to Peter, you know, whatever, or Peter says it and all that. He just, he remains elusive. And so he responds by saying, I am just what I have been telling you from the beginning. And even that, what's he talking about? Is he talking about the beginning of his entire ministry? Is he talking about the beginning of this conversation when he claimed to be the light of the world? Uh, You you know what I'm saying? But Jesus, he's telling them that he's already told them. So in everything that he's saying, he is declaring himself to be Messiah without using the words, I am the Messiah. And you can almost hear Jesus's frustration that they don't or won't understand. Jesus declares a couple of things. He has much to tell them. And in that sense, you might think of him in the role of a prophet. And he tells them that they have much, he has much to judge. And in that sense, you could think of him as a king or a priest. But do you remember it was just a few verses ago when he says, I judge no one? (laughs) (laughs) So you got to, you kind of got to go with what is being communicated and don't hang too, or don't grip too tightly to the literal words, right? What's being communicated? Um, he adds that the one who sent him is true, and, and you know, the, the seal of God is truth. That was a, a, Ju- uh, a saying in traditional Judaism. The only one who is truly true is God. And so, you know, the one who sent him is God, and that Jesus is only saying the things that he hears God saying. Jesus is laying it out for him, but John tells us they're just not getting it. In fact, They don't or won't even understand that he is speaking of the Father as in God, the true one. Yeah, I feel like that last statement that he says, um, after he says he has much to say and much to judge, but that specific phrase, but he who sent me is true, I feel like that might be Jesus' equivalent way of saying, you know, like in our current time um, when we have people that we know who on the surface it may seem like man they're acting out in life or they're it really seems like they're struggling in something and i think the appropriate response for people especially who are following god is to say like ultimately like only god knows what is going on with that person externally and internally so like in the end, it's not in our place to cast judgment or decide outcomes for that person because we truly yeah. don't know what's going on with them. In the same way, I feel like Jesus is saying that to these people. He's like, 
you can deny and you can reject what I have to say all you want, but in the end, like I know that God is true and God sees, and what I'm saying about myself, God knows me and knows that that is true, and that's what I'm relying on is, yeah. is like his ability to see clearly, not you all seeing me unclearly. Exactly, yeah. And and Jesus is, you know, he's only saying what God's telling him, what he's getting from God. So, yeah, I don't know. It's good. It's good. Uh, let's see. Where are we at? There's, uh, you know what, Samuel? Lucky you. They're not done yet. <laughs> John well, wait, chapter there's 8. There's more. <laughs> That's right. John chapter 8, verses 28 to 30. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And as he was saying these things, many believed in him. Okay, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, any guess what he's talking about there, Samuel? Feels kind of like putting putting him up on a cross kind of imagery. <laughs> I'd say, yeah, it's a very interesting statement. Uh, he uses the phrase, when you have lifted up the Son of Man. And just for curiosity's sake, if you wanted, you could go back to John chapter 3. Uh, you see it here in John chapter 8. You are also going to see it in John chapter 12. That's another thing that John is including. It's either Jesus being really consistent in his language or John using it in his storytelling, but that phrase, lift it up, it's an important thing. It's this image of the wave offering. Jesus was uh, resurrected on the third day. That's the same day that they did the, the wave offering of the first fruits of the barley harvest. So you see the connection. For our From our perspective, when he's crucified, his opponents, and I mean... You know, the ones that he's talking to right here, right now. They're going to see it. They're going to see that he is indeed the Messiah. And that's kind of a cre- incredible. He's, he's, it's kind of like he's predicting, hey, you guys. Yeah, when I'm up on that cross, all of a sudden you're going to see it. You're going to get it. They're going to see everything that Jesus said and did, that it was all said and done as an extension of God himself. They're going to see that he was nothing more and nothing less than the image of God, the true image that humanity was intended to be. They're going to see that God was with him in everything. They see every word, every deed was pleasing to God. Is everybody going to see that, Samuel? Mm -mm. No. So they're, they're, I mean, it suggests this little part of the scripture that, you know what, there, there was a, there was at least some. They were going to see it. This was going to be a big deal. Now, in some sense, we can kind of see that some of this happened in the book of Acts, but it doesn't seem to be explicitly tied to this. But we could also point out, uh, it isn't stated here, but the opposite would also be true. If they're seeing that everything about Jesus was right and good and godlike, all that, they're also going to see that everything about Jesus, everything, every word, every deed, it wasn't pleasing to them. And the fact that he is the one true image of God manifest in the flesh, that's going to be a very humbling moment, a very convicting moment. They're going to see that they have been God's enemy. So this is, this is a neat little part of scripture, what he's talking about here. And then John adds again, wait, I, many believed in him. So there's a great struggle that's going on within Israel. You got those who, I mean, literally wanted him dead. And there were those who wanted the life that he was offering. And again, you got the leadership in Israel. They weren't really on his side, generally speaking. Let's just say majority. And, and then if, if you were to take the people as a whole, well, again, the majority of the people were not accepting him. But that doesn't mean that there weren't great numbers. There were great numbers of people that were, you know, going along, going, man, this has got to be the guy. It's got to be the guy. 
And among those who did accept him, to be fair, you had some who were more serious than others. And and how do we know? What's the thing that, that distinguishes them? Well, repentance. Returning to the law, returning to walking in righteousness the way God defines it. It's not the way we would define it for ourselves or whatever. So it's, it's a, I don't know, it's a cool picture. It's a cool picture. And remember, I know we've talked about this before, but I want to keep laying it out there so that when we get there, it's going to feel like, man, you know, it makes sense. There's going to be a huge crowd. When Jesus comes back to Jerusalem for his triumphal entry at the time of the Passover, John has given us insight into how his time in Jerusalem on this last Sukkot was part of the building up of this great following, even in the midst of all this tension. So it's a neat picture. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to point out the, I just see a lot of hopefulness in Jesus's dealings with these people because he goes from, in the previous section, we walk through about telling them that they're going to die in their sins based on where they're at now. I mean, he could have left it at that. I mean, that was a fair and true judgment according to how they were acting towards him. Yeah. And then in this this section, it's almost as if he's saying, like, when you see me pour out, and I don't know whether the language indicates whether they would have had any indication by lift lifted up, if the, if that has any connections with dying in their culture, but if somehow it did, and He's evoking the sense of whenever I'm emptying myself, giving all of myself for this purpose of bringing the kingdom, like that's when you're going to believe. Like it just showcases yeah. that he he didn't give up on those people. Like he still had hope that they were going to turn things around. So I just think that's really cool. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And if, and again, I'm putting it out there as an if. But if he was going even further to say, hey, some of you standing here right here right now, you're actually going to see it on that day. It's you, The light bulb is going to come on. If that's what's being said here, that's an even greater mercy. That's mm. just, it's, it's unbelievable. I just, yeah, I love this stuff. The book of John, it's so deep, so wide. It just, it's crazy so good mm-hmm. it's like an onion you gotta cut through the smelly outer layers in order to get to that spicy goodness in the center maybe john was an ogre <laughs> better out than in i always say <laughs> yeah so you know what we're gonna fit this in I mean, it is, we're going through the Gospel of John. People should expect us to go over a little bit. Hopefully we won't, but if we do, at least you'll know why. So here we go. One last bit. John chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Oh, clear as a bell, isn't it, Samuel? (laughs) So, all right, so many have come to believe even while he's talking. Okay, so then again, with many Jews and we're here in Jerusalem. So it starts out, Jesus addresses them, the ones who believe. 
And Jesus makes it very clear. He makes this point. True believing is accompanied by abiding in his word, which is to say, continuing in his teaching. And I'm sorry to say it, but it's the same story we've been telling over and over and over in this podcast. Sincere belief or faith must be accompanied by faithfulness. That's what makes for a true disciple. And then there's a bonus. Bonus! If you are a true disciple, you will know the truth, which is to say, you will come to know the truth. And, and that's that, I think we can go back to that Hebrew concept of yada, mm-hmm. intimately knowing the truth. You're going to come to know God like you could not know him any other way. And again, how are we doing that, Samuel? By abiding in his word, which is faithfulness, right? So this is the path to freedom, and it's true freedom. And if we remember, take the the big, big overarching story. The end of the story is God with us here in creation, and we are in perfect sync with him because the Torah has been written on our mind and on our hearts. So discipleship, being a disciple of Christ, is seeking that now, to whatever degree we can have it now. When we seek it with all that we have, knowing that we have that expectant hope of the fullness later, presumably after resurrection. But now this, see, this is where it's weird. It starts out by saying, So Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, verse 31. In verse 33, it says, they answered him. Well, it makes it sound like that they would be the Jews that believed him, except that they go on about, you know, they wanted to kill him and, I mean, you know, all this thing. So obviously, he was talking to, let's call them the good guys, and the bad guys respond. (laughs) I mean, that's what's going on. So somebody responds, it's they, and I'm assuming that it's not the Jews that believe in him because otherwise it makes this thing super, super weird. They respond with a crazy comeback. We've never been enslaved to anyone. And I mean, come on, other than Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, they were absolutely (laughs) correct. Right? Yeah. Yeah. What the heck are they talking about? Now, okay, Samuel, do you think they so ignorant? <laughs> I mean, do you think they're so ignorant that they don't know their own past? Or, I mean, to be fair, even their own present? They'd have to be in crazy denial if that was the case. Yeah. And, you know, actually, the way you said that is interesting because I think that's kind of it. They're obviously trying to communicate something else. They're not trying to say we've never been enslaved because that's just, I mean, they're in it now, at least occupied, whatever. They're saying something else. And, and here's here's a thought, and I don't know that this is absolutely right, but you'll get the idea and you could fill in the blank with whatever you think makes sense to you. As children of Abraham, they had an understanding that they were the only truly free nation. Free from what? Free from idolatry. Well, how can they be free from idolatry? Because they were serving the only true God. Not only that, they had this expectation of the kingdom and of eternal life. They worshiped the one and only true God. So what other or new or different or better freedom could Jesus offer than that? Now, Again, I don't know if that's really what they were trying to say, but at least you can make some sense of that. They weren't talking about literal enslavement or not, so it had to be something else. So they they imagined them free in some way. So Jesus tries to help them understand, but here's the thing, though. You're not free because you are slaves to sin. And what's important about that, this is true for them and it's true for any and all of us, They had made themselves slaves. And if you're a slave, you're only temporary in the house. 
Now, in this case, we're talking about they are slaves in, in, in God's house. And if that's the case, then they're only temporary. So he tries to help them understand, and this is beautiful because it's coming from Jesus. He's trying to help them understand that being sons of Abraham by physical descent wasn't true sonship because true sons remain forever. They were more like slaves. And to be fair, they're going to get this. This is going to make sense to them because they already had the examples right there in, in, in their history of like Ishmael. He was a son of Abraham, except he wasn't Israel, right? His, his line wasn't counted as included. How about Jacob and Esau? Esau and his line, they were left out. We know that that was there for them to see it, but did they get it? I don't know. And I'll tell you, a little hint for the future. When we get into reading all of the stuff from the Apostle Paul, this is a concept that Paul is trying to get across as well. Being in physical descent isn't the answer. You got to have a faith like Abraham's, not just be mm. in the physical line of Abraham. But anyway, we don't know if they're really getting it or not. But Jesus, uh, he takes them back to his original point. If they would abide in his word, and again, that's to continue in his teaching, to repent, to keep Torah, they would be free indeed, as opposed to the freedom that they mistakenly thought they had. A true son, and this is good, oh, this is good, Samuel, a true son in the house can set a slave free. And when he does, that slave is free forever. So, so to get that picture, Jesus is the true son in God's house, and he can set you free, and you would be free forever. Even free within the house, they would be like true sons. That's such a great image. But again, we don't know if they're picking up on that. Mm. But Jesus tries to make it even clearer. I don't know if he can. I know that you are physical descendants of Abraham, he tells them, yet <laughs> you want to kill me because my words are offending you, which there's your clue that he's not talking about to the ones who believed in him. These had to be the opponents again, right? My words are offending you. And here's the thing. The words were given to him by the father. And ultimately, and this is, you know, we've said that Jesus being the word and the Torah being the word, they were in a sense, that same agent from God, if you, if we could say it that way. So ultimately, the words that Jesus is speaking, speaking, given to him by the Father, are the same words that were given to Israel by the Father. They're just being a witness against themselves. Jesus speaks of what he sees the Father doing, but they speak of the things that they hear from their real Father, and he never tells them who that is, but, you know, we get the idea it's Satan or, you know, whatever. But Jesus just kind of leaves it hanging out there. Jesus' father is, you know, the father, God, but they have a different father. Mm. Oh, that's tough stuff. Um, is there any chance that Jesus is referring to um, that in that last verse, I speak of what I have seen with my father and you do what you have heard from your father that he that he could be referencing to like the difference between God as spiritual heavenly father and then their relationship with their patriarch Abraham as their like you know the father of the nation that yeah. he could be saying like you're you're keeping this on a strictly physical uh genealogical sense and it's way more than that. Like it's it's transcendent with what yeah. like God partnering with the people group that you're trying to use as a defense against me. It goes beyond the the land that I promised you to have that you're dwelling in now. Like it, it it's like the redeeming of all of reality itself. Um, I don't know if that could be one way to interpret that. Yeah, I think that's possible. And, and, and I'm, you, so you could look at it and you could say, you know, your fathers, as in like the patriarchy mm. or, you know, whatever. And you could even say your father, like in your earthly father. Mm. 
like you, you've been given bad info somewhere along the way. There could be that too. Uh, so yeah, I think, I mean, c- sure. Could it be? Yeah. Well, yeah. Why not? Yeah. I think so. I think my tendency is since so much of evangelicalism has in, went ahead and interpreted it for us that Jesus is speaking about Satan. I just, I like to give space for there to be other things as well. <laughs> yeah. Not, not sure. to say that it's not that, but uh, it also could be something else. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we've already had it. We've already had somewhere where he talks about, you know, their father being the devil. Yeah. Right. And, and I, I bet you we see it again somewhere, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I think I, I sure. Why not? I also really liked your comment about Jesus trying to help them understand that being sons of Abraham by physical descent wasn't true sonship. And you you gave several examples for us, but one that came to mind for me uh, that involves Abraham directly. Look, when when Abraham was still not bearing a child after God had promised him that he was going to have a lineage that passed on after him. What did Abraham resort to accepting was going to be his fate? He was, he was, in some sense, the text kind of implies that he was accepting that Eliezer, his servant, was yeah. going to be his heir. Yeah. And that's not physical descent. In some ways, that's a, a quote-unquote slave, which you can connect to his language here oh. right now. So yeah. I just, that's, that's another cool little connection there. Yeah. Yeah, and that is so interesting because when we talk, and I I don't even say we, when the New Testament scriptures talk about Abraham and his faith, they talk about it like he was unwavering. And it's so funny because, well, he went and had a kid with Hagar. Uh, He he said, oh, God, what are you going to do? I mean, Eliezer is going to be my inheritance. What what am I thinking of? His heir. Heir, Yeah. (laughs) going to be my heir, you know, and it's like, really, that's unwavering, is it now? Uh, Mm -hmm. It's just, we just need to understand that when God is looking at him, he was pleased with Abraham. And even in Abraham, we get to see when he falters here and there. So we push hard that people have to pursue righteousness and, and all of that, but it's never to the point of perfection. I mean, it, for most of it, it's so completely irrelevant because we've already blown it before these words ever fall out of our mouth. I know I'll never be perfect because I've already blown it a bazillion times before today. So it's, but it's, it's that pursuit. It's, mm-hmm. he is worth that kind of effort. Yeah. If you're not even going to try to be perfect, well, it's like you're not even honoring what you've been given. He's not expecting you to be, but man, how about you, you know, put a little skin in the game. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a good thing. Yeah. Pursue righteousness and obedience with everything you've got, but leave room for grace where you fall short along the way. Well, now that's a good place to end it. We're (laughs) done. (laughs) Okie dokie. Thank you for listening to the Okie Dokie Most Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And be sure to leave us a rating and a review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. You can find out more information about the podcast at www.okidokimos.com. And if you'd like to get a hold of us, please send us an email at okidokimos at gmail.com. And until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon.